Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for hopping on. We are so excited to have you here today and to present to you on an incredible topic. I'm just gonna give you a few moments to get situated, to grab a cup of coffee, um, and get ready to listen to this incredible presentation, but I'll call you back in about three minutes. Thanks so much. For those of you still coming in, just wanted to say again that we're just giving you about one more minute to get situated and then we will start our presentation. All right, everyone, welcome back. We are ready to begin our incredible presentation this morning on testing your defenses against the top 10 miter attack techniques. And today we have Joe Mastro Marino and Jack Well speaking to you. And at this time, I will pass it over to you, Joe. Sounds great, thank you, Madison. And thank you everybody for joining us today for this Attack IQ Weekly Demo. First thing I'm going to do is introduce myself and talk about how we're going to go through this demonstration today. So my name is Joe Master Marino. I am a New York City based sales engineer here at Attack IQ. Been here just shy of a year. That 18 plus year career in technology, most of the time spent in security, a long time in financial services. Also done a lot of IR, forensics, long sim background as well. So Part of the reason why I'm here is I've seen controls work and not work so well all the way up and down the trail and what that can lead to in terms of uh, your control validation. And the last part about this is that I'm going to run this demo just a little bit differently today, but don't get scared. I promise this is going to work out well. Why I say that is because it's going to lead me to my next slide, which is going to be a question that I'm gonna ask of my co-presenter. And I'm gonna be doing a lot of this over the course of this discussion today. So the first question that I'll ask my great co-presenter here, Jack, today is, for Jack, if you could please tell us a little bit about yourself. Jack, I believe you're on mute. Hey, thank you. It wasn't let me. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hey, Jackson Wells here. Um, I'm based in Dallas, Texas, and I currently work at Attack IQ as a customer solutions engineer. And as a CSC, my main goal is to help customers operationalize the platform. After they purchase, I hop on calls and make sure that your technical needs are met and you have good strategy using the tool. Uh, prior to being at Attack IQ, I was in the United States Navy for about four years, stationed up in Connecticut at the first submarine base, uh, submarine base New London. 
Uh, after I got my sea legs with some IT security and networking, I moved on to Critical Start and MDR, where I worked for about four years as a uh, senior analyst as well as a detection engineer. Um, another thing I do here at Attack IQ is I work on blogs like our newest um, attack graphs and threat actors out there. I contribute detections and mitigations to help defend, as well as an academy instructor, where my latest course is actually this top attack techniques tool. Uh, lastly, um, I like to get certs. Um, my, my latest and one I like to talk about the most is my OSCP. Um, this is by Offensive Security, and this just helps me think as an attacker and test better and defend better. Back to you, Jeff. Thanks for that, Jackson. And as you can see, we have security experts, longtime technology experts all throughout your, uh, your life cycle here at Attack IQ. So let's talk about what this discussion is gonna go like today. First thing is we're gonna talk about the problem that we're always trying to help solve. How we've done that before, where you can go to get started. And part of that is gonna be that demonstration that we were talking about earlier and then where you can go to learn more. First thing, let's discuss the problem. The problem, and Sisyphus, thank you for always showing me this problem here, is that this is what it feels like when you don't know whether or not your controls are working. You're working really, really hard to keep pushing that boulder up the hill, but you know at some point it's just gonna come back down again. To put some stats on top of that, and some of this comes from things like the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. Part of this comes from even our own research with our, uh, with our customer base. Presented about 82% of breaches, the security controls to stop those things were in place to stop the breach, but they failed. And 85% of all data breaches involved some elements of human error. So it's not just the systems, it's also, it's not just the technology, it's the whole system, which includes the people. And in our, in our customer base, so over 70% of our customers in a recent survey found that at least 25%, at least one quarter of their security controls were not working. So put that in the back of your mind for a moment. In your organization, what quarter of your controls do you feel like you could do without? Which then leads us to that there are a few different ways that you can figure out the effectiveness of your security program. Either you can do it or you can let somebody else do it. Personally, I'd rather be the one that's doing the, the testing of my own controls. The good news is that we have solved this problem before. There is a better way to do that. So if you could have a world where you had complete confidence in your defense in depth architecture that you know you've been verifying that those controls work, that the technology does what it says on the tin, that your teams work the exact way that they're supposed to, that your processes are leading you to the outcomes and the metrics that you expect so that you can measure everything that you have and you can leverage all the technology to automate, validate your security stack without having to add whole new teams for this. You don't have to you know, drop a whole bunch of FTEs and more teams on this. There is absolutely a way to do this. And one of the first things that you have to do in order to be able to do this is to adopt a threat informed mindset. I, I know I've done this myself, that we think in terms of lists, you start with something like compliance. It's one of the things that I started with, especially for uh, my time in financial services, we think in terms of compliance lists, how do we get down the list, check all the boxes and then move on. The fact of the matter is, the real adversaries are not thinking that way. They're thinking in terms of what are their real outcomes? What do they want out of the systems that they are trying to break into? And they think a lot more graphically, a lot more dynamically than a simple list. That's generally what leads us to the idea that this is the way that we really need to start thinking about the way that we measure our performance against attacker activity. Can we put real metrics behind that and measure it over time, realize our marginal gains over time because we are indeed measuring the correct performance indicators for our security stack and continue to advance the state of our own practice? Where do you get started when it comes to this? Because I just throw a whole lot at you and you're like, well, okay, that's great, but where do I get started? 
one of the places you can absolutely get started is with a common rubric of being able to say, this is what attacker activity looks like, sounds like, feels like, and this is how we can measure it. The MITRE ATT&CK framework, for anybody unfamiliar, uh, the adversarial tactics, techniques, and common knowledge. What are the goals that an attacker has and what are the methods that they are going to use to get to those goals, to get to those outcomes? The MITRE organization maintains this attack framework and this is something that is commonly used across the industry to be able to describe all of the things that we were just talking about, all of that attacker activity. And it's not just the MITRE organization alone. There is also the MITRE Ingenuity Center for Threat and Form Defense, which funds a lot of research and collaborative projects with a number of different organizations in order to advance the state and the art of the practice of a threat and form defense. You can see that Attack IQ is right up there, is one of the founding research partners of the Center for Threat and Form Defense. We bring together major financial services organizations, uh, critical infrastructure companies, uh, nonprofit security organizations as well. You can see the names right there on the side of the screen. Some examples of the projects that are led by this collaborative organization include things like threat actor emulation plan research. So putting out emulation plans for attacker groups like APT29, MenuPass, different financial groups as well. So there's a lot of good intelligence that comes out of that that is then openly shared. Also includes security stack mappings for cloud technologies. This is a high item on a lot of people's radars. And this group helps with mapping those, uh, those security stacks against the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So how does that measure up with Azure and AWS, for instance? The Attack Flows Research Project, being able to take the intel that we're looking at and be able to translate that into a graphical representation, like I mentioned earlier, that anyone would be able to read and clearly understand. And the thing that we're gonna be talking about today, that's why I left that one to the end, this top attack technique tool, a way to help us measure uh, our own controls and how we can start to work towards that with that common rubric again, which is now gonna lead me over into my second question for my co-presenter here. Can you please give us a brief on the top attack technique tool and who created it? Yeah, absolutely, Joe. So first off, the top attack techniques tool was created by MITRE Center for Threat Informed Defense. And as you put, Attack IQ is one of the founding partners for that organization. Um, one of our most recent tools we've worked with them with is this top attack techniques tool. Now, what this really does for us is helps organizations start smartly and effectively with the MITRE ATT&CK framework. If you've ever seen the MITRE ATT&CK matrix, it can be daunting at first. A lot of techniques, a lot of sub-techniques that apply to different verticals and attack vectors. So this tool really helps you nail down on which techniques you should focus on for your organizational needs. That sounds like it would help out just about every security organization I can think of. Um, Jackson, can you tell us a little bit more about how you got involved with the project? Yeah, absolutely. So back to my previous experience as a, a security analyst and a detection engineer, um, I've had eyes on glass as an analyst for years, just seeing different threat actors and, and how they use TTPs to get into an organization, move laterally, exfiltrate data, et cetera. And additionally, I've been a detection engineer where I help bridge the gaps for security products and help different organizations defend against these attacks. And all while I was doing the analyst work and the detection engineer work, I used the MITRE ATT&CK matrix uh, as, as a backbone to help me figure out what I should be defending against and how. Now that this tool is coming out, I found that really interesting and I really wanted to hop on it and find out how we can use this for better defending. Yeah, that sounds like something that would really help out, especially as you're trying to figure out the, the, the different ways to explain how this stuff is happening between different tool sets and between different teams. So kind of on that thread, can you describe the value that someone would derive from using this top attack technique tool in conjunction with a platform like Attack IQ. Yeah, sure thing. So we've already spoken on a bit of the value of this tool um, and how it identifies what techniques you should be focused on based on your organizational needs. But once you have a visualization 
of the techniques that may be applicable to your org, um, then it start, you start asking the question, well, are we defended against these? Do our mitigations and defense plans actually hold up against these threat actors using these techniques? That's where attack IQ comes into play because you can find scenarios and emulate these behaviors to see if your security tools, your configurations, and your detections all hold up against these attacks. So in that sense, it kind of becomes like a divining rod of these are the things that we really should be worried about and how can I marry that with content that I already have in a platform like Attack IQ. I have that right? Exactly. Awesome. All right, so let me talk for just a moment about the architecture of Attack IQ. This way everybody has a common understanding of this platform that we're talking about. And then from there, Jackson, I'm going to have you dive into a demonstration of the platform and that top attack technique tool. Sound good? Sounds great. great. So the Attack IQ architecture. I always start talking about this slide right in the center where it has that management web UI, Attack IQ management workstation. That's the machine that you use to interface with the Attack IQ platform. So you can use your web browser as Jackson will be doing over the course of the demo. You can also use, and we have a very robust REST API for doing things like executing assessments and, uh, and lots of reporting features as well. The Attack IQ management platform is typically delivered in a SaaS fashion, although there is an on-prem option available if that's required. What that platform is then going to do is it's going to sit there and have access to all of the content that you are going to want to use in the form of these attack scenarios, all of these different things that we want to run. Now, where do they run? Well, that's gonna be where the Attack IQ lightweight agent comes in. On the lower right-hand side of the screen, you can see that we have support for Windows, Mac, Linux, and then we can also do some things in containers. Those are extremely lightweight agents, and I've worked with many agents before. When I say lightweight, what I mean is that these are not protective capabilities. These are not hooking into the kernel. They are very light in that all they are doing is they are going to check in with the management platform wherever it's delivered once a minute and ask, do you have any work for me to do and do you have any updates for me? No? Okay, I'll be back in a minute. Once it has work to do in the form of those attack scenarios as they've been assigned, they will download everything that they need at that time, unpack, stage everything, execute everything that it needs to do, and then report back to the platform. Was I stopped or was I not stopped or prevented? It'll clean everything up afterwards, reverse any changes that it made. And all of these attack scenarios, by the way, and we have about 3,000 of them in our, in our library at the moment, constantly curated, pruned, make sure that we have uh, the most accurate and appropriate content in there. And it's gonna clean everything up and it's gonna return it right back to steady state. So these attack scenarios, we like to say that these are also, because we, we ask you to do with those agents, is to deploy them in production, because the attack scenarios uh, are safe to run in production. The first thing we try to do is to, of course, do no harm. Uh, so we're not going to be detonating things like real malware inside of your environment. What we're going to be running with those attack scenarios are going to be more of the emulation of the behaviors rather than trying to execute real malware. All the behaviors that those malware uh, samples would have executed, those are all going to be present there. So you are going to exercise your controls, but it's not going to be anything malicious that's running inside of your environment. On the left-hand side of the screen, you will see that Attack IQ Integration Manager. That Integration Manager is going to then natively query your entire security stack as it relates to the scenarios that you ran. If you ran endpoint scenarios, then it's going to query your EDR. If it ran network security control, uh, network security uh, uh, scenarios, it's going to query your firewalls. And it's also going to be able to query your SIM if you have all of your logs centralized in one place in that, in that way. So that's going to give us back whether or not we detected the things occurring inside of your environment, which gives you a complete picture of did I stop the thing that I wanted to run and did I see the thing that I wanted to run. So with all of that out of the way, now we have a better context for what this is going to look like when we go through the demonstration. So from this point, I'm going to ask Jackson if you could please take us through a demo, and I'm going to try to change the presenter over to you and see if that works. I'm going to hit that. And are you able to present now? I am. Can you see my screen okay? Absolutely. All yours, buddy. 
All right. So we'll go ahead and start with the MITRE ATT&CK Techniques tool. Um, and first off, to get to this tool, all you need to do is go to topattacktechniques.mitreingenuity.org. And it will bring you here to the homepage. And at first, you'll see that the homepage is the ransomware top 10 list. Um, so the calculator is where most of the features reside for this tool, but we need to do this page some justice because every organization should have defense plans against ransomware techniques. And what the Center for Threat Informed Defense has done here for this tool is they've evaluated over 20 different ransomware families and found the most common techniques used amongst all of them. Here we have the top 10 of those techniques listed. So we know if you were to get mitigations and defenses against these, you're getting a lot of bang for your buck on ransomware defense. Now looking at all 10 of these, you can drop down any one of these and see some information on what this technique is and why it's used. And if you ever want any more information, feel free to click this link and it will bring you to MITRE ATT&CK's website where this will show you a more verbose description. It'll show you some procedure examples of threat actors that use this and how they use this technique. Scrolling down a bit, it'll also give you some mitigations and detections. So this is a great resource for you to get started with any ransomware type defense. Moving on from here, I'm gonna to pivot to the calculator, which you can access in two different ways. There's a calculator tab up here, or you can just click on this top 10 calculator. So loving this load up. So here we are presented with the calculator and right away, you can see there's quite a bit of configuration options and I'd like to go over these a bit. So on the left side, uh, we have a filters portion. Now, this is what really allows you to be granular about your organizational needs and see techniques that apply to you. So first we have NIST 853 controls and CIS security controls. If you drop these down, you can start filtering and seeing techniques that apply to any type of compliance control you wanna test. So if you're interested in, let's say access control, it would be wise of you to just check all the AC family so you know that every scenario or every technique that's generated applies to access control. For the sake of this demonstration, we're gonna hold off on any of the compliance related filters. But going down here, we see detection analytics. So by default, it's gonna have the CAR or cyber analytic repository, Elastic Search Sim, Sigma, and Splunk as four different repositories for detections. Now by default, whenever you generate uh, generate results and you see techniques generated, they're all going to either have a detection or mitigation in one of these families. And if you're only interested in one or a couple of them, you can absolutely use your filter parameters here. And then you can do operating systems. Now every organization is set up differently. Some places are typically Mac OS, some are Windows Linux hybrid, uh, some use a zero active directory. This allows you to be able to filter down to your organizational setup so you know that the techniques that you work on apply to your setup. So for this, I'll just go ahead and check Windows and Linux. Now, before I hit generate results, we have one more column that's worth checking out. And these are the monitoring components. Now, every company has defenses on network, process monitoring, file monitoring, cloud monitoring, or hardware. For example, your firewall, or content filtering proxies would be this category, or you have EDRs that kind of work on these, et cetera. So what you would do here is you would choose, you would really rate your security settings on these categories. For example, for network monitoring, if you know that your firewall is really locked down, you have great administrators with great rules and detections, you can say, hey, we're highly protected in this category. I will change that to you have high network monitoring. What this would do is if we were to generate results, all the techniques listed would, would be more focused on any of these since you have lower security to them. And any network related technique would be more towards the bottom because it doesn't need as much love and care. So again, for this example, because I want a lot of results here, I'm going to go none and generate results to see everything that applies to Linux and Windows machines. All right, and when you click that, you're going to see two things pop up, a column with 10 techniques the top and a description which we'll go into here in a bit now before we dive into some of these techniques i want to express you may be asking yourself why is maybe you know number three t1053 higher than number six t1021 we know that these techniques all apply to your filter conditions and your monitoring conditions 
but how are they ordered? Um, and this is a very important feature of the tool. There's a weighting system that this tool uses, and it has three components. It has availability, prevalence, and choke point. So really quick, every single technique is weighed against each of those components, starting with availability, which availability really measures how easy is it to add mitigations and detections for that said technique. If you're wasting time and resources on a technique, that it's very hard to mitigate or detect, that's going to take a lot of manpower and, and time to do. And you might get attacked 17 different ways before you actually mitigate one technique. So it wants to give you something very doable up front. Not only availability, though, it also measures on prevalence. What prevalence is, is how often that this technique is seen amongst threat actors and how often it's utilized with those threat actors. So now we're comparing, is it actually able to mitigate and detect? along with, is it actually something used a lot with a lot of threat actors? And one more component is choke point. And what this is, is saying if you do mitigate the actual technique, how, how likely is it to actually put barriers for other attacks from occurring? So with those three, availability, prevalence, and choke point, we can see that it listed number one, command and scripting interpreter. So what that's saying here is saying, if you were to mitigate this, you'd have an easy time because there's a lot of mitigations and detections. It's in a lot of different threat actors and organizations. And if you were to take steps in defending against this, it would possibly stop a lot of other techniques from being able to occur. So that's how the order is actually structured. And if you ever take a look at this order and say, hey, we do have good defenses against this and we don't need to see it, you can exit out and take note that T1562 is right here. If we were to delete this, that takes its spot and the next one fills in based on the weighting system. Um, if you have any more techniques applicable to your filter configuration. So now that we went over how the techniques are actually displayed, you have a good view of things that might be really smart for your organization to work on for your defense plans. And on the right side, any one that you click on will generate a verbose description of that technique and more importantly, show you all the sub-techniques that may apply to how they can carry out that specific technique. If you look at PowerShell as a sub-technique, for example, you can click on it and see a description of that sub-technique and some mitigations and detections for that. You can click that and see the sub-techniques again, scroll down, and also see mitigations and detections for the overall technique itself. So this gives you a plethora of ways to implement in your security products to make sure you're secure. Now, one last thing I want to show you on this calculator page here is I know some people like working with APIs and they're very programmatic. So if you scroll down a bit, you can download all top techniques. And what this will do is prevent, present you with a JSON object that can use in your coding structure that presents all of the technique names, all the mitigations and detection IDs, and allows you to actually code this into your software. So at this point, we have a very solid understanding of how it lists the techniques and why it lists them. And it gives you information on how you can defend against them. That's very helpful. But once you're at that stage, you might ask yourself, OK, now we can go ahead and implement these detections and mitigations. But how do you know that they're actually working? Or how do you know that it's actually going to stand up against a true attack? Well, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to wait for an adversary to answer that question. So the next step is we can go ahead and take a look at the Attack IQ platform and how we can put those into the light of your attack products. So here I have the scenario library in Attack IQ. And there's two ways you can search scenarios. By the generic scenario search, which we'll go over here in a second, and the MITRE attack view. I decided to start with this because this is a really good visualization that matches with what we're trying to do. So what we did here is break down the whole entire MITRE matrix, and we can see all the techniques that apply to the tactics. So if we recall, number one being T1059, command and scripting interpreter, that's something that we know it's highly actionable, prevalent, and would have a high choke point value. So I know I would want to make sure we have defenses against that. If we go here, we can quickly see that under execution, it does have this technique. And we can drop this down and see that it shows the sub-techniques as well. It says PowerShell 39. You go ahead and click on that. And it's going to show you 
all the scenarios that we have available for you that would one way or another test using PowerShell through a command and scripting interpreter technique. So right off the bat, I can see executing a coded PowerShell might be something we wanna test. I might wanna see, are my user permissions standing up to allow certain users to or not allowed to run PowerShell? Are my security products alerting on encoded PowerShell being ran? Um, if so, are they taking action to prevent? These are all questions you can get answered with the platform. So once you've gone ahead and searched some of these um, techniques that you see fitting uh, appropriate to your techniques or sub-techniques, you can really start writing those down or mapping them to make an assessment. So I'll go ahead and go here, and this is an assessment that I've created, and I went ahead and gave it, gave it a title. And we can look here and we can see we have 10 scenarios for this assessment. I can go ahead and click Manage Scenarios. And what we're gonna see here is all the individual scenarios that test each technique or sub-technique. So we already went over encoded PowerShell, but again, we have something like disable system firewall. So where did that come from? If you look at the top techniques here, we can see that we have T1562 and pair defenses. Now, if you take a look at this and read the description a bit, you understand what you're trying to defend against, but more importantly, if you look at some of the sub-techniques, you can see here that one of the ways that people impair defenses is by disabling or modifying the system firewall. So you may have looked at this and added detections or mitigations or may not have, and you wanna see where your security products stand up. That's why we go ahead and add these to the assessment. And here we have all 10 that would test one way or another of those sub-techniques. So once you have it configured and you have some assets assigned, in this case, we have three devices, one with the CrowdStrike sensor on it, one with the Sentinel-1, and what I like to do is always add a baseline with no technologies on it. That way you can kind of compare and see how some are acting and some aren't. So once you go ahead and run this assessment, we can go ahead and view some of the results here. Now, I wanna say, when we were reviewing these results, um, you're gonna see a lot of red not detected for the detection column. I don't want you to, to judge the security product on this and say, um, that they're not detecting things. I ran this in a lab environment with very little configuration or no detections at all, just so we can see some of the output here uh, and see what it would look like if you have a lot of work to do. So taking a quick look here, um, we can see that this is organized by the scenarios themselves. If you recall, we had 10 scenarios and three assets. So each one of those scenarios is gonna run across each asset. We can see that here where we see the disable system firewall ran three times on the different assets. And we can see all three times they ran, they were prevented, which is great, but they weren't detected. That gives you information saying, well, if we wanna be detected on this, can we adjust our policies? Can we create a detection to start seeing this or, or make any type of configuration rule to start seeing that show up? But more importantly, you can scroll down and see things like this, not prevented or detected. This is usually something as an action item that you'd want to remediate. So we can look at this and say, well, we were able to create a scheduled task for persistence on this device successfully. I would want to know why that was and what we could do to start defending against that. So you can click into this. And what this is going to show you is a high level overview of this actual scenario and how it performed. We can see the actual detailed findings here, which is just saying a scheduled task with its title was successfully created and executed at this time. So you might be curious on what exactly happened. You can click activity details and see some of the system information that actually happened during this time. What was ran, how it was ran, and when it was ran to give your analyst or detection engineer some fuel on creating detections. You can scroll down and you can see mitigation recommendations. Now this is either stuff that the attack IQ team has written or stuff we've gotten from MITRE's uh, mitigations. And this is a verbose uh, knowledge base of things you can imply in your environment to actually defend against this. And then we have detection details. And as we know, there were no detections in this case as we are in the lab environment. But if you were to have detections, which I can go ahead and go to one with detections, it will show you of all the ones that it found and give you a link to where they are. And lastly, we have the indicators of compromise or IOCs. 
Now, what this does is give you artifacts that was performed during the scenario run. So if you have an investigation or IR team that wants to look and see if you have telemetry data of this detail or some sort of artifacts you can work with on creating a detection for next time, this is a great resource. So that's the high level overview of how the marriage of this topic tech techniques tool can be utilized, how it works, and then how you can actually use that to test your infrastructure in the Attack IQ platform. So with that, Joe, I'll go ahead and give it back to you if you'd like to finish up. Sure, I and mean, that is a fantastic demonstration. Thank you for showing us how we can put all those pieces together. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there should be a button there somewhere for you to pass the presenter back to me. Awesome. Let's show my screen again. There we go. Uh, so the last thing that I promised you, how can you learn more? Uh, of course, there is the Attack IQ Academy, which is a piece that we've been really leaning towards again this whole time. In addition to the Attack IQ platform, the uh, um, the top attack technique tool that, that Jack's been uh, graciously showing us through this entire time, but there's another place where you can go to learn more. Now, the Attack IQ Academy, and anybody can go to this. This is a completely free resource that we make available to the community, academy.attackiq.com. Again, that's academy.attackiq.com. Completely free resource. You can go ahead, sign up for an account. We have over 32,000 registered students at this time. Uh, high net promoter score, which means that uh, the people really like the content that they're getting. Uh, it's very high quality instructor-led training. Uh, 20,000 certificates already awarded for students that have been going through the courses that we have there. Um, so it's uh, lots of things from learning about MITRE ATT&CK, learning about how purple teaming works and breach and attack simulation, um, the security stack mappings, lots of those projects like I was talking about that happened with the Center for Threat and Foreign Defense. And we were lucky enough to have one of those instructors on the, uh, on the demo with us today the top attack techniques uh, is the class that you see there on the right, that was written and taught by Jack Wells, who was doing that, uh, who was doing that demo today. So I felt like there was no one better to give this demonstration today than the man who's been through the, uh, uh, really been through that project and has done a lot of that marriage of the top attack techniques with the, uh, with the Attack IQ platform. So really, really grateful that he was able to join us today for that uh, uh, for that piece of it. So definitely go and make use of those courses. Uh, a lot of those are really, really digestible and easy to get through uh, it, it, in terms of time. I know that Top Attack Techniques course took me, it's about a 45 minute or so class to get through. These are uh, fairly short bites, but a lot of things are really, really usable in practice. So very high quality stuff and we continue to put out more content there. So in summary today, we talked about what that problem is, how we can start to get more of that content and be able to put it in common terminology that we would not only be able to use, understand, uh, and then put into practice, but how we've solved the problem before, tools that you can use, and you can use some of those tools right now to go and to help understand this problem even better. Now that we've shown you some of the places that you can go to leverage the tools and the information that are readily available to all. If you have any other questions, you can please feel free to reach out to uh, myself and Jackson will be happy to answer any of your questions or direct them to anybody who can help you answer those questions. So thank you all very much for your time today. Uh, Madison, I will turn it back over to you for any closeout. Thanks so much, Joe, and thank you, Jack. Thanks everybody for tuning in today and we will see you next time. Again, like Joe said, please reach out if you have any questions. We are always here and happy to answer anything that you may need. Okay, have a great one. Thanks so much.